Welcome to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, Editor-in-Chief of Southern Living Magazine. And y'all, this is an artist I've admired for a long time. A four-time Grammy Award winner who's known as one of the best songwriters of his generation. Jason Isbell was born to parents who were still teenagers in a small town in North Alabama. And as a result, he spent a lot of time with his grandfather, who was a Pentecostal preacher and a guitar player. By high school, he was immersed in the music culture of Muscle Shoals, and in his early 20s, he was playing the sold-out crowds with the drive-by truckers. As a solo artist, Isbell has become known as a poet of the rural South, who's not afraid to speak his mind. Now he's got a terrific new album called Weather Veins, a collection of songs that continue his tradition of storytelling with an edge. We'll talk about all that, plus his grandmother's cornbread, how to wring a chicken's neck, and his experience as an actor in Martin Scorsese's upcoming movie, Killers of the Flower Moon. All that and more on a very special Biscuits and Jam. Well, Jason Isbell, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Where am I reaching you right now? I'm in Austin. We're playing here last night, tonight, and tomorrow. Oh, great. Is this Austin City Limits? The venue, not the show. The show just normally films one show, but the venue also has shows there. We'll be back to do the TV series next month. Oh, great. Well, so, Jason, you actually came to the Southern Living offices back in, I think, 2012 and performed at one of the first things that we ever did called Biscuits and Jam. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, on the back porch there. Yeah, and we actually served biscuits that day, I think. Yeah, they were pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they didn't have a whole lot of rise to them, but that's okay. That's all right. They tasted good. Oh, you've got pretty good memory. Yeah. I mean, you got to watch the bacon powder. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you really have to. If your bacon powder is out of date or if it gets a little clumpy with the humidity, you're going to have cat heads whether you want them or not. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good advice. Well, listen, you sang a few songs that day, and one of them was called Alabama Pines which is still a favorite of mine. I'm just wondering, do you remember where you were when you wrote that one? Yeah. Yeah, I was home in Sheffield. That's when I lived in Sheffield, Alabama. And what was the story behind that song? The song is about feeling like you don't belong and uh, wanting to return to a time when at least your memory tells you that you fit in somewhere. Now, there are things in that song that allude to the idea that maybe that place doesn't exist in reality. It just exists in your mind. You can drive through Talladega on a weekend in October. Just head up north to Jacksonville. Cut around and over, watch your speed and boiling springs. They ain't got a thing to do, they'll get you every time. Somebody take me home Through those Alabama pines Well, so you grew up in Alabama. You've written a lot of songs about North Alabama over the years. Tell me a little bit about the place where you grew up. I grew up in Green Hill, which is about half an hour from Muscle Shoals. Uh, So right on the Alabama-Tennessee state line. And yes, a very small, just unincorporated community down there. The school went from K through 12. My grandparents lived next door to the school. So I spent a lot of time there at their house. I would walk to school. And my grandfather was a Pentecostal preacher and a musician. Not a musician by profession, just he played in church and played with the family. And my dad's brother, my uncle, was a musician. And then I had people on my mom's side that were also her brother and her dad. And my parents didn't play anything, but pretty much everybody else in the family did. What were your grandparents' names? Carthel and Louise. Carthel? That's one I haven't heard before. Yeah, I haven't heard it either. I don't know that there's another one out there, but they called him Kit for short, like Kit Carson. And this was a Pentecostal church? Yeah, holiness, holiness. So it was, you know, under the umbrella of the Pentecost. And were you made to go to church quite a bit? Yeah, but my mom's family went to the Church of Christ, and my dad's family was Pentecostal. My parents didn't, we didn't go every week, but I went a lot. And it was a very different atmosphere because the Church of Christ was super quiet and restrained and no musical instruments, voices only. The Rogers girls, Lydia and Laura, secret sisters, went to the 
Church of Christ that my mom's family went to. I went there about half the time and then went to the Pentecostal church the other half. And I did at some points get my wires crossed, you know, and it would be time to pray and I would start yelling out loud and speaking in tongues. I'd be four or five years old and my poor mom would get so embarrassed. I remember, I remember her saying, stand up, stand up, be quiet, be quiet. This is not that church. (laughs) Uh, They should have said something before I went in. I just thought church is church, you know, but it was a very different scene. Very different. Because my granddad's church was like, they had an electric band, they had a bass, drums and all that kind of stuff. It was raucous. And so was that one of the first places that you started playing music? Mostly it was at home because that's what my grandfather did all day, every day. He had animals and tended to them and some crops, just a little small personal farm. And and he tended to those, but the rest of the time he spent playing instruments. And so he would play fiddle or banjo or mandolin or something and have me play guitar to play rhythm for him, you know. And it was always these big dreadnought guitars and I was so little that it was a physical feat, you know, just to try to reach around the thing. And and if I would start slowing down, he'd say, Oh, you're getting lazy, you're getting the lazy arm <laughs> and I would play with him for hours at a time and he would reward me by playing blues music for me because that's what I really loved. And he would lay the guitar down his lap and tune into an open tuning and play it with his pocket knife. That was the thing that just really, really got me. Like once I had heard and seen that, I was pretty much done. Wow. Yeah. You don't hear about a lot of Pentecostal preachers who play the blues. Yes, you do. You just have to look in a different neighborhood. (laughs) Sacred Steel is a legendary tradition, you know. Wow, Um, really? Yeah, yeah. Robert Randolph came out of that. Wow. Yeah, but that's normally like straight steel or uh, pedal steel, you know. But I believe that those two churches and those two forms of music were originally one. The fact that my grandfather called laying the guitar down and playing it in his lap, the blues, I think, is a direct reference to what they're doing in the sacred steel churches. Mm. When that Robert Johnson Complete Recordings came out, he took me to the record store and bought a copy of that. And I was probably, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old, and I was just obsessed with it. But he went back and made cassette copies of all the songs that weren't vulgar. And so he gave me the Max L cassette tapes that didn't have Traveling Riverside and stuff. And then when I turned like 15 or so, he gave me the originals and said, I think you can handle this now. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that I'd been listening to all those songs all along. You know, I, I figured I'd do him a favor and just say, oh, thank you. Thanks for having faith in me. <laughs> but it's so funny because, I mean, I've seen for the 1920s. Lyrically, yeah, I mean, it's out there. But it's so funny that we've been having that same sort of argument over what you can say and can't say in music for a 100 years now. <laughs> yeah. And then I had a really good music teacher in middle school who would travel. You know, we didn't have a committed teacher at each school. We had one that went to all the different schools in the county. His name was Michael Nix, and he loved the Rolling Stones more than anything else in the world. And he would come in and teach us all Beatles songs and Rolling Stones songs. And I started asking him questions, and I was, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And he was so shocked by my questions. Everybody was asking about what was on the radio at that point, but I wanted to know about these old blues songs. So he started calling me out of class, and he would kind of mess with me a little bit, you know, and make it sound like I was in trouble. And I had to go to the principal's office, which I think made the other kids think that I was cooler than I was. So now in hindsight, (laughs) I appreciate him for that. He was doing you a favor. He was, yeah. I would get a call on the PA, you know, Jason Isbell, come to the principal's office at once. And I would know that it was him from the exaggerated tone. And I would get in there and he'd have a mixtape he'd made for me of R.E.M. or something that, you know, I would have no access to otherwise. And that was great. That was formative for me. And he's since passed away, but I ran into him a few times after that. He would come and see some shows and stuff like that, which was really cool. Mm. Jason, I want to talk about food for a second. And I'm wondering who was the, the cook in your family? You know, pretty much everybody. My mom's mom can't make a biscuit. That is a a running thing in our family. I think she tried a batch at one point, and they were so bad that they got buried in the yard. And the dog dug them up and wouldn't eat them, reburied them, buried them back in the same hole after he tried one. But she can cook. She can cook all kinds of stuff. Just not biscuits. 
there are cooks and there are bakers. And the people who tend to do things by their own rules and the people who don't go by the book, they make very good cooks, but not very good bakers. That's very true. The chemistry in baking has to be precise. And if you try to, I think it'll taste better this way. No, baking will show you that you must go by the rules. But my mom was a good cook. My grandparents on my dad's side, my grandmother cooked very traditional stuff. She cooked on a wood stove and, you know, she made cornbread and fried chicken and biscuits and chocolate syrup. Some people call it chocolate gravy. We call it chocolate syrup and uh, red eye gravy. My grandfather loved red eye gravy, which is just grease. It's really just grease. Right. He was tough. He was old, old fashioned tough. His top teeth were all fake, so he had the fake palate to hold him in, and he would drink his coffee out of a percolator. When he would lose his patience with the coffee, he would just pick it up off of the wood stove in the drip and drink it, just right out of the boiling. I think he just wanted us to know he could do that, because the roof of his mouth was covered, and the rest of his throat was so scarred that he'd just pick it up and drink it. Put that steel percolator tip on his bottom teeth and drink coffee out of it. I'm not kidding. He would take drip coffee and he would put instant coffee in the cup instead of sugar or cream and stir it up to make it stronger. (laughs) They could drink it at 10 o'clock and go to sleep at 1030. I've never seen anything like it. My grandmother literally would get up in the middle of the night and drink a cup of coffee and go back to sleep. (laughs) They drank caffeinated coffee all day and all night. Wow. They don't make them like that anymore. They sure don't. Probably for the best, you know. Uh, (laughs) He would teach me that if I was going to eat farm animals, I would have to learn how to kill the farm animals. So when I was probably my daughter's age, she's about seven, he taught me to wring a chicken's neck. And this is how I learned also not to name the animals. Right. But I found a chicken and chased it around until I finally got it. And I was all sweaty and out of breath. And then, you know, you grab the chicken by the head and you twist it around in a circle as hard as you can and then you stop and try to snap it like you're slapping a towel and if you're lucky the body of the chicken will come off and you'll be holding the head if not the whole chicken will fly off and you know it'll flop around for a minute and that'll be it and so he taught me how to do this and then the next day he said all right i need you to do that to a goose we're gonna cook goose and i was set that's a whole different deal it was a very (laughs) different yeah i was being set up to fail and i went out and got a hold of the goose and the geese were mean They would put their head down on the ground and get that hump in their neck and put their feathers out and make themselves look bigger. But I finally got a hold of the goose, and I got to swinging it around. And its neck just kept getting longer and longer and longer. And it was probably, I don't know, 12, 15 feet long by the end of it. And I was frustrated. I went and got the axe. On my way to walk to get the axe, I heard him laugh, and I looked up. He was on the back porch. He'd set me up. The whole thing had been a practical joke at the great expense to the goose <laughs> but that was his it's the humor and that was his idea of uh entertainment that was a good time <laughs> that was a good time for him yeah there was a family story about one time they had disassembled a man's cow and a buggy and they had reassembled the buggy with the cow attached inside the man's house you know when they were kids there was like 12 of those kids and they were horrible troublemakers and he carried that with him he had that sense of humor for his whole life i had the incubator where i would take care of the chicken eggs until they hatched and he would go in and inject dye food coloring you know into the eggs and the chickens would come out pink and green and purple you know i don't think it hurt them like they would keep until they shed their initial down they would be that color so every easter would be a surprise i'd have all these chickens all these crazy colors yeah Wow. (laughs) Jason, I want to talk about music and uh, Muscle Shoals for a second. You were born into one of the most kind of magical music places in the world, really. And other than your grandfather, I'm wondering if there was one person who was really a mentor to you when it came to music. There were a lot. Once I got to the age where I could get out and around and go into town and see people play, I remember when I was 13 or 14, they would have like the WC Handy Festival and everybody would play in all the bars and stuff. And I remember my mom would take me and just beg door people to let me in. And sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. I would get in occasionally and then other nights they just wouldn't have the time or the patience for a little kid in there. But 
we would go see the decoys all the time, which was David Hood and Kelvin Holly and Scott Boyer and Mike Dillon and NC Thurman. And we would follow them around. And then Barry Billings was a big deal to me because he played at this Mexican restaurant in Florence every Friday and Saturday night. And the thing about Florence was that they had the 5149 law. So you had to sell more food than alcohol, which was bad for venues. You couldn't have a music venue that way. And they would check the receipts at the end of the month and shut you down if you didn't do that. But it was great when we were 15 or 16 because it meant that there couldn't be an age limit. They couldn't kick us out. We're in a restaurant. We don't have to be 21. My mom would drop me off there to watch Barry and Danny Kirsch and Joey Flip and Mary Mason. And we would stay for three or four hours and just like order, I don't know, some cheese dip or some tea or something. You know, we'd have about $9 between us. And just order enough to where they would let us stay. And George, the owner of the place, the place was called La Fonda Mexicana. It was in Florence. And George got to know us, and we got to be friends with their whole family. And I still talk to them every once in a while. The restaurant's gone, but it was perfect for us because Jimbo, my bass player, would hang out in there, and Chad, my drummer, and Chris Tompkins, who was my best friend then. And, uh, you know, he's written like 15 or 16 number one hit country songs now. But we would all camp out there on Friday, Saturday nights, and they'd get up to sit in with them. And sometimes we'd be up there the whole night. It was instrumental for me because I didn't know how to play with a band. I'd been sitting in my room playing guitar by myself or playing with Chris in somebody's garage or something. And this was the first time I had to actually pay attention to the song and play for the song. And, and I learned a whole lot. Barry was so patient. I remember one night he turned around in, in the middle of the song and he said, now, when somebody's singing or if somebody else is soloing, maybe you might not want to solo at the exact same time. You know, Maybe you might want to play some chords or just not play anything at all. And I was like, oh, I see. <laughs> Later on, I realized that that was about the nicest way he could have put that. Most people would have been like, shut the hell up, kid. Just, Back off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Barry was huge. And then David Hood was another person I spent a whole lot of time around. And I know Jimbo, my bass player, did the same. And David was always very gracious with his time. And we would ask for advice. I remember asking David, how do you do it? How do you get to the point where you're a professional musician? You've played on all these hit records. I wanted some kind of mystical magical secret from him you know and and he said well you show up on time and you make sure all your gear works and you be nice to everybody and i was like yeah and what else you know and he was like that's pretty much it he would never take credit for the quality musician that he was but he was proud of the fact that he showed up on time <laughs> and he was right that'll set you apart from 90 percent of the competition if you take it seriously in every profession yeah right if you take it seriously and be a professional after the break i'll talk more with jason isbell about john prine his own songwriting working with martin scorsese and much more Welcome back to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, and today I'm talking with the Grammy Award-winning musician and now actor, Jason Isbell. Jason, another influence I want to ask about is John Prine. You opened a lot of shows for him, and I feel like your songwriting and your storytelling have a lot in common, and I'm just wondering if he was a big influence on you before you got to know him. Yeah, that was not by accident. I definitely stole from John on many occasions. You know, I got to know him real well. We got to be really good friends, and I value that time that I spent with John about as much as I value anything. The way he saw the world and the details that he noticed and the things that he allowed himself to be moved by really sort of informed not just his work and his songwriting, but the way he lived, the way he interacted with his family and the people that he cared about. And John was one of the only people who, in his 70s, would be watching the clock on stage because he wanted to play longer. Most people that age were ready to go to the hotel and go to bed, but John was always upset when it was time to end the show, you know. 
It was a special thing. My mom would play me those records when I was little. When I was a baby, we'd sit and listen to them in the floor of the trailer. So I grew up with John's music being a big part of my life. And then to actually get to know him was about as big a reward as you get in this profession. I mean, it's nice to live comfortably and take care of your family and all that, but nothing really is better than getting to know those people and them turning out to be everything you'd hoped, like John was. Yeah. You know, I uh, interviewed his wife, Fiona, a couple of years ago, and she was telling me how John came home one day and handed her a CD, and he was all excited. And he said, go get in your car and listen to this right now. Mm-hmm. You are going to flip out. And uh, it was your album, Southeastern. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah, Fiona's told me that. And I think he tracked my booking agent down in a, maybe at Arnold's one time when they were having lunch or something. I think that's how we actually initially got to working together. John Paul White was making a record on Donnie Fritz at Gary Nicholson's studio. And John Paul called me and Amanda to come over and sing. And John Prine was there and Al Bonetta was there, John's old manager who passed away a few years before John did. But Al had one of his old muscle cars. You know, he loved the old muscle cars. And they were there and we met John that day and we all seemed to hit it off real well. But yeah, after he heard that record, he wanted to do something. We went on the road together and he also went out with Amanda a lot. She opened for him and played with him at a bunch of shows. Well, Jason, I want to talk about some things that you've got going on right now. You have a lot ahead of you. And among other things, we'll talk about the album in a second, but you were cast in a movie with Martin Scorsese that he directed called Killers of the Flower Moon. It was shot in Oklahoma. What drew you to that story? Man, the story is unbelievable. When we were on lockdown and couldn't tour, I called my agent and said, maybe if there's a movie or a TV show or something I can be involved with, that might be fun. And he started looking around, and sure enough, Marty's cast and director, Ellen, was open to let me audition for a role, and I just kept on working at it until I finally got the part. But the thing about that story is it shocks me that I didn't learn it in school, and even the people I talked to in Oklahoma who grew up and went to high school out there didn't know about it. The Osage people had been pushed around and moved around like a lot of the indigenous folks close to the end of the 1800s. And they had a really brilliant chief who spoke multiple languages and was just by all accounts a genius. And he had the idea that they should locate themselves on this spot of land in north central Oklahoma where white people couldn't survive. He said, we can live off of this land, but they can't. So they won't make us move if we go here. Which in and of itself is a pretty bleak proposition, but the tribe was grateful for that. And that's where they moved and set up, you know, their lives and their community. And then they found oil. And when they found oil, they very quickly became the richest group of people in the world. So they were wearing furs and they were buying custom color Hudson's. And then, of course, the white folks got wind of it and started marrying off the Osage women and murdering them and all this kind of horrible stuff started happening in the name of acquiring those mineral rights and then auctioning them off to Getty and Sinclair and Phillips. And it's really just a breathtakingly sad story. But one that needed to be told. It needed to be told. And the way Scorsese presented the story to me made a lot of sense. His idea to work directly with the tribe and focus the perspective on their experience rather than the white savior trope, it really rang true to me. And when I got there and met a lot of the Osage folks who were working on the movie, some of them playing their grandparents or aunts, uncles, or fellow tribesmen who had passed away a hundred years before, it became pretty obvious to me that he had done a lot of work to make sure he told the story the right way. So it's something I was very proud to be involved with. But at the same time, I was also terrified because I didn't, I don't know how to act. You know, that's not my job. And the other people there have Oscars for it. A lot of my scenes were with Leo. And luckily, most people at the very top level of their field are generous with their time and they're kind and they're helpful and they just want the whole project to work. And they'll do whatever they need to do to make sure the whole thing works. Now, when you get to the level right under that, you run into a lot of different ego issues. And it's not 
so comfortable for somebody who might see themselves as an interloper. But in this situation, I just asked questions. I said, what the hell am I supposed to do? I've memorized everything. I've done all the work that I know to do. How do I deliver this in a natural way? And I got lucky because they were kind enough to guide me. And it became a really beautiful experience. It'll be out in October, I think the 20th of October in the theaters. Well, I can't wait to see it, but I hope you're not handing in your guitars anytime soon. <laughs> I like my job, and I'm going to keep my job. People have asked me if it's something that I would do again, and then I say, well, if it's something like this, and then usually they stop me, and they say, there is nothing else like this. Catering is never this good. The crew is not this huge. The trailers aren't this nice. It's not like this. I kind of started at the top in the movie making business, and I don't know that I'm going to do a lot more. But if there's a story that somebody needs help telling, and I feel like it's a story that should be told, then I'll do what I can to help. Yeah. Well, on the music front, Jason, you got a new album out and it's called Weather Veins and it's fantastic. I've heard it. Thank you. Thank you. Just so many great songs on that album. I want to ask you about the name of the album, why you picked Weather Veins and what that means to you. Well, it came from a lyric in the song Cast Iron Skillet. It's a simple tool and it's something that doesn't give you a lot of information. And then once you have that information, it is your job to use it to predict the future. And I think that theme works pretty well with a lot of the songs on this record. And it works pretty well for my view on life. Just the general idea of remaining aware, being prepared by being in the moment, rather than fixating on what could happen or what may happen or what will happen next, really slowing down and observing what's going on now. And then through that process, you see which way the wind is blowing, so to speak. So it made sense. And also it was a good vehicle for us to use the artwork to sort of scatter some references to songs, individual songs, and to also my career as a whole at this point. Well, you mentioned the song Cast Arm Skillet, which sounds like it could be a simple country song, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but it is not at all. Yeah, I mean, it is a simple song. The melody and the lyrics is simple. Now, the things that happen in the song and the emotions that are discussed aren't simple, but see, they never are. You know, even in what I would call a very simple country song, those emotions aren't simple to the people that are feeling them. One of the issues that I have with a lot of more popular country music these days is I think they aim low and they sort of patronize their audience in a way where it's like they're just ignoring the fact that feelings like heartbreak are very complicated And I try to dig in a little bit harder and ask a little bit more of the audience because I think they're perfectly capable of understanding that and handling it. Yeah. It's heavy, though. It's a heavy song because it is about race relations and murder. And there aren't two topics in the South that are more heavy than those, I guess. But, you know, those things really happen. Those are just stories from my childhood, from people that I knew, people that I was close to growing up. I didn't have to make up any of those details. Don't wash the cast iron skin This town won't get no better, will it? She found love and it was simple as a weather vane Her own family tried to kill it Don't wash the cast iron Well, it's also a beautiful song and beautifully crafted. Thank you. You know, I meant it. And I think that lends itself to make a better song just about every time. Some of my favorite songwriters don't work from a place of technical ability at all, but you can tell that they mean what they're saying. And that's all it takes for me. Yeah. There's another one on there called Vestavia Hills, which if you're talking about Birmingham is about a mile from my house. Oh, yeah. It's right down the road here. What inspired that one? So that's a story song, and it's about a crew member, a roadie, for lack of a better term, who has had enough. And luckily, his wife is fairly well off and has a nice house in a nice neighborhood. And it's basically a three and a half, four minute way of saying, I don't have to put up with this. 
I have a nice house and my wife pays the bills and I'm going home. That's basically what that song is. And it's sort of another angle on the cautionary tale because the perspective is from somebody on the outside looking in. He's seeing this artist that he works for falling apart and he's tired of having to clean up his messes and he goes back home. The crew guy is being professional and saying, here's my notice. I'll do this tour and this is the end of it. If you're in bad shape, you wind up asking more of your crew people than you should. And I've been that person myself in the past. It's been a long time, but I remember how that felt. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Jason, you and your wife, Amanda Shires, who is an incredible musician and fiddle player, y'all have a daughter together. I just got to ask, are y'all raising a young musician or is the is the jury still out? The jury is out. Mercy's really into singing and she started making up songs. And I think that's great. If I could have my druthers and choose what would come first, it would be that. I just want it to be something that is normalized for her to make up songs to explain how she feels about things. Yeah. And lately, just in the last couple of weeks, really, she's been getting kind of good at it. The other day, we were in Lubbock, and she'd written a song about the prairie dogs. And, yeah, I told her, that's actually really good. That sounds like a song that an adult would have written. But I'm not easily impressed by that sort of thing. And I heard her tell maybe three or four different people. My dad said this is pretty good, and he's not easily impressed by that sort of thing. She was proud of it. But then she watches a lot of our shows, and we do a lot of, like, musical excursions. You know, we see how different instruments are made and that kind of thing. So it's it's very much a part of her life. She hasn't, like, settled on an instrument to learn to play yet. But as far as the profession goes, by the time she's an adult, I don't know if anybody will be able to become a musician and make a living at it. I think if you're not grandfathered in, you might be shit out of luck by that point in time. But that doesn't mean that you can't be a musician. So I do expect it'll be something that's a big part of her life one way or another. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah, it's a great way to tell people how you feel. It just really works for that because you can kind of hypnotize them with the song aspect of it and the rhyming and the music. and You kind of lull them into this sense of paying attention to you. And then you can tell them things that you wouldn't normally say in a conversation. Yeah. Well, Jason, I just got one more question for you. Mm. What does it mean to you to be Southern? I think there are a lot of cultural benefits. I think I've had exposure to a lot of very creative people. And I think, obviously, there's a lot of conflict between generations. But there's also, if you're able to keep the nostalgia at bay and look at things the way they really are, I think being a Southerner is a great opportunity. I'll give you an example. When I was on The Daily Show the first time with Trevor Noah, he had me in a chair to interview me and talk to me. And most people just have me play a song and that's it. And I appreciate that and I'm happy to do it. But I love sitting in the chair and talking on a talk show because then it's like you feel like a real celebrity, you know. (laughs) It's not just like the court jester for the last three minutes of the show. You get an interview. It's a big deal. And I remember we were talking about the political climate in Alabama and Tennessee. And so many people said that that is the first time that they'd ever heard of me. And what really caught their attention was the fact that the things that I was saying did not line up with their expectations of my accent. You know, (laughs) they would hear my accent and they would think, wait a minute, what is he saying? That doesn't make sense. People with that accent say the opposite of that. I saw that as a huge opportunity to really show people that we have more in common than we have that separates us. And that You can't judge a book by its cover, and that always makes for more interesting people. I'm grateful that I'm from the South because it gives me the opportunity to develop my personality in a more complex way than had I been from another part of America or another country. Well, it's definitely complex down here, that's for sure. And just the music, man. I mean, it is. (laughs) It is. But one of the ways that we've always attempted to deal with that is by making music and There's no better region in the whole world for the kind of music that I like. So it's like winning the lottery being born where I was born because I was exposed so early and so consistently to really 
about as high quality art as anybody in America has ever produced. I don't know that anything we've ever given the world has had a greater significance or more artistic importance than the R&B that was made in the 1960s. I think that was kind of as good as American art ever got. And to be brought up around the people who had worked on those records and in a climate that was sort of infused with that kind of spirit, it has served me very, very well. Well, Jason Isbell, thanks so much for being on Biscuits and Jam. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Jason Isbell. Southern Living is based in Birmingham, Alabama. Be sure to follow Biscuits and Jam on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And we'd love your feedback. If you could rate this podcast and leave us a review, preferably a nice one, we'd really appreciate it. You can also find us online at southernliving.com slash biscuits and jam. Our theme song is by Sean Watkins of Nickel Creek. I hope you'll join us next week for my conversation with Asheville, North Carolina chef Marwan Irani, who's known for his James Beard award-winning restaurant, Chai Pani, and his spice company, Spice Walla. We'll see you then. <laughs>